Welcome back. This is Lecture 11, Part 1, and now we're going to begin to look at the overview of the book of John, the Gospel of John. And just before we proceed to do that, I want to remind you once again as your favorite thorn in the side, and that is to keep up with your reading. You should be in pages 285, uh, 254 all the way through 278 in Dr. Carson's book, as well as pages 129 to 133 in Dr. Benway's book, Keep up with your reading. Uh, you'll find out soon enough that you should have kept up with your reading when you receive the exams. <laughs> I need you to understand that. Okay? Um, I want to do what we have done basically in the other books, and that's we're going to go through the actual book of John so that you are familiar with it as, an, as, a, as a panoramic overview of the book of the Gospel of John. And I need you to comprehend from the perspective that John is writing. And if you recall, the last time we had discussed this issue, I had said that Matthew, Mark, that Matthew and Luke, they begin with the story of the birth of Jesus. And the Gospel of Mark begins with Jesus' baptism. However, the book of John starts completely different. It's, it begins before, before creation itself. So you will note that there's a vast difference in the perspective at least and, and, and to the approach of how each book proceeds to unpack for us the person of Jesus. We're going to look at this overview of the book of John so that you become familiar with it. So you're going to need your Bibles because we're going to go right through this on a page by page all the way to the 20, 21 chapters. And I want you to see that like Luke and Mark, as well as Matthew, that we don't have a chronological presentation or a biographical presentation of the Gospel of John from the perspective of John. What we have here, okay, is more at more of a canonical, uh, and this is a diff a quite different. It is the presentation of the events through the eyes of the author and how they unpack the events. It doesn't change the details. It does not change the facts. It's just the way it is presented. So where we are right now, for example, uh, the fact that we're standing right here right now uh, and, and we're in front of all of you here this morning, you will discover with me that we could have come in from, we, we could have come in right now. In fact, what we could have do is come in from the uh, south okay, west entrance or uh, I'm sorry, we could come in or from the northeast entrance, uh, the southeast entrance, or we could have come in from our west entrance, or we could have come in from our east entrance. Okay? Doesn't matter which way you approach the sanctuary, okay? it doesn't matter how you approach the classroom here, the fact of the matter is that you've arrived at the same place. The fact is that we're in this location right now, how you approach this, some of you came from the four distinct corners. Well, the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John do the exact same thing. They just rearrange some of the events and they emphasize certain things more than others. Okay? And so I want you to comprehend, and some of the parables, and some of the stories, and some of the miracles right, that are shared among the gospel writers themselves, right, also are presented differently from, that, from, from their unique perspective. But it does not change the facts. So I want you to comprehend that um, as we approach this book. So quickly, what we'll, I like to do right now is to look at this with you in terms of just, uh, just we're going to run through it really quick here, and then we're going to get, we're going to bog down, and then we will bog down into the actual details of it. First of all, uh, we begin with looking at um, a basic outline, uh, which uh, if you should have, you should have picked up your notes coming in through the door as well, and those of you who are tuning in, you should have downloaded those already. I want you to see with me in your handouts, okay, at point six, an outline based on the following facts. A, a philosophical theological prologue. That's what we have starting immediately at the book of John, and that begins with John chapter one, verse one, all the way to 18, and this will be like a sandwich, okay? There's two ends to this, 
And then we have on the other side, extreme side, we have a practical epilogue, okay? So we have, a pra we have a philosophical, theological presentation, a beginning, and we have a practical ending, and that would be John chapter 21. And I think what's unique about that is that sometimes in ministry, we're so involved in the spiritual depth and the breadth of the Word of God right, that we forget we're all supposed to have to, we also have to be involved in the practical application of it. And really, as you start out before creation in John chapter 1 and then you wind up in John 21 which gives us a practical instruction on to feed the sheep take on the work of the church, take on the work of discipleship, take on the work of winning the lost to Jesus, we, uh, we take on the work of, okay, of, of growing up the sheep, growing up the membership, and so forth and so forth. So we, set, we have these two extremes, that, but they come together in a very healthy balance. B, the other thing we want to look at is that we have seven miracles, uh, signs, seven miracle signs during Jesus' public ministry, during the time that his ministry was actually public. And that's probably the area that you and I need to help our people with in understanding in that when we read the Gospels, whether it be Matthew, Mark, Luke, and or John, and we happen to be in John at the moment, is that we just read the stories, we read the parables, we read the miracles, we read the dialogues, and sometimes we don't distinguish when this took place publicly and when it was, when it was a private ministry and when it was a public ministry. And that's really key. So what do we begin with? We begin with seven miracle signs during Jesus' public ministry. This section is all public ministry. This would be John chapters 2 all the way to John chapter 12. So we have John chapter 2 all the way to John chapter 12. All of those chapters is the actual public ministry of Jesus Christ here in the book of John, as well as what we have is their interpretation of all of these unique miracles that took place. There are interpretations as to why they're there. Number one, let's look at the first one. We have the changing of the water into wine at the wedding feast in Canaan. We have the changing of the water into wine at the wedding feast in Canaan, and that would be John chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. John 2, 1 through 11. Two, we have the healing of the son of the officer at the court of Capernaum. We have the healing of the son of the officer at the court of Capernaum. That's the second miracle sign that we have here, and that would be John chapter 4, starting in verse 46 and going all the way through verse 54. Then with number three, we have the healing of the lame man at the pool of Bethesda, and we have the healing of the lame man at the pool of Bethesda in Jerusalem. That is John chapter 5, starting in verse 1 and ending in verse 18. Then number four, we have the feeding of about 5,000 people in Galilee, and that's John chapter 6, verses 1 through 15. And then we have number five, the walking on the sea of Galilee, that is John chapter 6, verse 16, all the way to 21. And then we have the healing of the man born blind in Jerusalem. The healing of the, of the man born blind in Jerusalem, that is John chapter 9, uh, verses 1 through 41. And that is actually a profound chapter. Um, I, think some of the, uh, I think one of the challenges, uh, another challenge that we face is that we read, we read about the miracles and the signs and even the dialogues that take place and every unique dialogues and, and we just treat them in an encapsulated form just by itself and don't understand the profound significance of them. But the healing of the, man, of the man born blind in Jerusalem is a powerful teaching, and it is a rather consuming teaching itself in John chapter 9, verses 1 through 41. And then we have the um, number 7, the raising of Lazarus in Bethany, and that's John chapter 11, verses 1 through 57. John chapter 11, 1 through 57. So this is a significant amount of, of scripture here that covers this, this, and this, this particular raising of Lazarus in Bethany and there is profound teaching there on the resurrection as well as on salvation. Then we have interviews. If you remember this and I'd said this in our last couple of classes uh, some time back now, two, three, four classes back, I mentioned to you that John, the book of John is unique in that it has 27 unique identifiable dialogues, interviews that take place in and by and through the person of Jesus Christ. And so we'll look at some of those as well here. We're looking at number one, John the Baptist. 
<clears throat> excuse me, that'll be John the Baptist. There's a kind of whole dialogue there, and that's is John chapter 1, verses 19 to 34, as well as John chapter 3, verses 22 to 36. And then we'll look at the dialogues that take place through the disciples. Um, Andrew and Peter specifically have a dialogue with Jesus. This is John chapter 1, verse 35 to 42. And then we have Philip and Nathaniel um, also have a, a, a separate dialogue with him, and that is John chapter 1, verses 43 to 51. And then we know the famous dialogue in John chapter 3 with Nicodemus. Uh, the, the Nicodemus, and that is John chapter 3, verses 1 through 21. And that, in fact, is a fascinating chapter. In fact, it's the most, most well-known chapter in the New Testament is John chapter 3. And most of us, at least in, um, in uh, you'll see this a lot of times at different sporting events. You see these people, they got these little signs up and it says John 3.16. And it's, it's always troubled me uh, when I see those signs uh, for, for a different complete reason. You go, well, Brother Eddie, what are you talking about? I mean, um, you're supposed to be a pastor. You're supposed to be a, 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 a teacher in theology and a seminary and so forth and so forth and so forth. Why would that bother you? I said, well, let me, let me tell you what bothers me about it is that I've been to enough events and spoken to enough people, and I asked him, I said, I said, what does that mean up there, John 3, 16? And I am always amazed, okay, at the number of people that surround me and say, I have no idea what that means. No clue. And so we got this cardboard up there, you know, with a sign that says John 3, 16, and I am just amazed that that is one of the most well-known biblical references. But when you ask people to explain John 3.16, how so few actually can explain what is John 3.16. So we basically have reduced uh, the book of John, or actually the chapter 3 of the book of John to verse 16. And, have complete, and, and here's a classic example where we take a text out of context and now it becomes a pretext and, it's a, and it becomes a pretext for ignorance because people, most people can't tell you what John 3.16 is. They've got this vague notion of it, but they couldn't, they couldn't give you an adequate uh, explanation of it. Now you would think for the kind of exposure that John 3.16 has received that we would have an entire nation able to articulate particularly accurately, okay, what John 3.16 is, and yet it is not. And so John chapter 3, verses 1 through 21, becomes a fascinating chapter in of itself when you begin to just look at the dialogue in verse 1, which actually begins back in John chapter 2. At the end of John chapter 2 is where this dialogue be actually begins, where you have Jesus dealing with the issue of people who came to see the signs and the wonders. And we kind of, see, we, we kind of forget that in addition to that. And that's the problem with only looking at verses instead of lo looking at these large paragraphs that have been written throughout. So for our purposes in our class, we break down the verses only to identify content. That's what we're doing it for, just to identify content, right? And so I want you to understand that. Then we have also the dialogue with the woman um, of Samaria, and that is John chapter 4, verses 1 through 45, and that's another extensive portion of Scripture and where this long dialogue is taking place with some profound significance. Number five, we have the Jews in Jerusalem and this entire encounter that takes place in John chapter 5, verses 10 to 47, and then we have the crowd in Galilee, and that is John chapter 6, verses 22 to 66, where Jesus makes some of the most profound statements okay, about the Word of God itself. It's found in this particular section, particularly at the end of this section. And then we have the discussion with Peter and the disciples. That is John chapter 6, verse 67 through 71. And we have Jesus' brothers, the whole conversation that takes place there with John chapter 7, verses 1 through 13. And then we have, in addition to that, we have the Jews in Jerusalem. And there's this whole series of discussions that take place here. And that is John chapter 7, verse 14, all the way to John chapter 8, verse 59. And then again in John chapter 10, verses 1 through 42. And then we have the disciples in the upper room, that whole conversation that takes place there. That is John chapter 13, verse 1, all the way through to John chapter 17, verse 26. 
And then number 11, we have Jewish, uh, the Jewish arrest and the trials. That's John chapter 18 and a large portion of scripture from verses one, from verse 1 through 27. And then we have the Roman trial. The actual trial, that is John chapter 18, verse 28, all the way to John chapter 19, verse 16. And then we have the post-resurrection conversations that take place. And that will be obviously John chapter 20, verses 11 to 29. And you know that there's a conversation with Mary. There's a conversation with the ten apostles. There's a conversation with Thomas there. And then we have the well-known epilogue, okay, in the that dialogue with Peter, the Apostle Peter, and that's John chapter 21, verses 1 through 25. And uh, much discussion has been raised and much discussion has, been, has taken place with regard to John chapter 7, uh, verse 53, all the way to John chapter 8, verse 11. And there is much debate as to whether or not the story of the adulterous woman, uh, and, and that is that it, that story was originally not part of the John's gospel, and much debate has raged over that. But that will not be the purpose or the focus of our class here. I just mentioned it in passing to you that that is an issue that has come up. Um, then we have uh, also that's unique to the book of God, the Gospel of John in our outline. It would be the feasts, the various feasts and the various Sabbaths that are celebrated in detail. And that would be at least four of them. Number one, the Sabbaths, do all the, the issues of the Sabbaths come up. That would be John chapter 5, verse 9, John chapter 7, verse 22, John chapter 9, verse 14, and then John chapter 19, 31. Then we have the discussion of the Passovers, the various Passovers, and that's discussed in John 2, 13, John 6, 4, John eleven fifty five, and finally in John 18, 28. <clears throat> In addition to that, we have the Feast of the Tabernacles that is discussed in John chapters 8 through 9. Those two chapters, uh, in, everything that takes place there is during the Feast of the Tabernacles in John chapter 8 and chapter 9. And then in addition to that, we have Hanna, Hanukkah and the Festival of Hanukkah or the Festival of, Festival of Lights. And that is John chapter 10, verse 22. And then, of course, we cannot leave without mentioning the great I am statements. I am. And we see that. <clears throat> and we see that way Jesus responds in the affirmative when he makes these clear statements of his deity. Any accusation that Jesus denied his deity, Jesus was some kind of a secret Christian, he didn't uh, identify himself and so forth and so forth. I've heard all kinds of nonsense. No, that's not true. Just read the text itself. In fact, Jesus says, I am he. He identifies himself as the Messiah, as the Son of God, the one who is to come. And he says that in John 4, 26, John 6, 20, John 8, 24, 8, 28, 8, 54, all the way to 59. In addition, John 13, 19, and John 18, verses 5 and 6, and finally verse 8. Secondly, we have the I am the bread of life statements that are made by Jesus himself, and that is John 635, 641, 648, and 651. And then we have his other statements, I am the light of the world, those statements that he makes in John 8, 12, John 9, 5. And then we have I am the door of the sheepfold. He makes those profound statements in John chapter 10 in verses 7 and 9. And he also makes the statements, I am the good shepherd. That's John chapter 10, verse 11 verse, and verse 14. And then he also makes the statement, I am the resurrection and the life. <clears throat> That'd be John 11, 25. And then once again, another famous passage that we hear about and quoted often, that would be John 14, where he makes the statement, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And that is John 14, 6. And then I am the true vine. That's John 15, 1 and 5. So I want you to see that these become the major themes by which we structure the book of John around these issues. Some of the things that you need to briefly identify and that becomes more unique to the book of John and that be only because it's emphasized more and that would be uh, the concept of the word, 
capital W-O-R-D, the Word of God, that you see the most often as where you see in the other Gospels and the Epistles, you see it with the small w. Okay? It is in reference to the same thing, but it's much more unique as to the Word in the book of John. And then we see the concept to believe, believe much more readily in the book of John. And we see the world was made through him, uh, very clearly identifying him from the creation story. That's the reason why the book of John starts out with before creation, as opposed to um, Matthew and Luke, which begin with his birth. And Mark begins with his baptism, but John begins before the creation of the world. And so now, if you understand that he begins before the creation of the world, then you understand the phrases and the terms that are used in John are unique because that's where it begins from. That's, that is the th philosophical and theological prologue of the book of John, and you need to comprehend that. He deals much more with the concept of truth itself in John. He deals more, well, he deals with the issue of the prophets in John, uh, the Lamb of God. That phrase becomes much more uh, uh, as a dove or the rabbi or rabbi, rabbi. You see that? Uh, his concepts where he makes the double emphatics, uh, uh, truly, truly, verily, verily. You see that much more in the book of John. Uh, the angels of God ascending and descending. Ending. And this is and this is all in chapter one that I'm referring to. Why? Because you need to comprehend it starts out with the before the creation of the world. And that's the reason why John starts out with something completely different as opposed to Luke and Mark and Matthew. And then we have in chapter 2, then we begin to see the signs and the wonders and so forth, and as well as the various confrontations. It doesn't take long uh, if you remember the whole concept of the six water pots. Okay, that comes out in John chapter 2. We see the rule of the Jews. That will be Nicodemus. Uh, we see the being born again, John 3. We see the Son of Man must be lifted up. That's John 3. We see eternal life uh, finally being discussed much more uh, intensely there. I am the bread of life in John chapter 6, the feast of the booths. And I told you that John discussed all four feasts uh, very specifically. We see that in the book of John. We'll see the Sabbaths discussed. We'll see the Passovers discussed. We'll see the feast of the Tabernacles discussed, and we'll see Hanukkah discussed, and we see the events that take place inside of those various uh, um, feasts that take place. We have the feast of the booths, uh, the booths, and then you, and then we have the confrontation that you have a demon where he's uh, accused of that, and then we have the discussion of the disappor or the dispersion taking place. Um, you even have the conversation Jesus was not yet glorified. Uh, if you remember that, uh, he also makes a statement before Abraham, I was. That's the reason why you got to go back to understand. People, people uh, why does he make that statement? Well, John starts out before the creation of the world. It establishes his deity right in verse 1, immediately. Um, he was put out of the synagogue. Uh -huh. That takes place in John as well. Um, he, where he says, I am the door of the sheep. And he paints the whole picture about what a pastor's job is. And he, also, we have the Feast of Dedication is discussed. Um, blaspheming, being accused heavily of that. Uh, we have the Satan and, and then entered into, I, I, into Judas, if you recall that. And so we have all of these concepts are much more readily discussed and identifiable to the Gospel of John itself. And I want you to comprehend the unique difference of John. Welcome back, Lecture 11, Part 2. Now let's look at an, oh, a global outline for the entire book of John so that we can hang our hat on it and we have a way of structuring and working through the book of God, John, the Gospel of John. And so what we're going to be looking at is basically uh, 26 points. We're going to be looking at major points. And I want you to just it looked at, look, just look at it, and you should have those handouts with you, and you should have downloaded it with it. So number one, we're going to look at the witness of the revelation of Jesus Christ. That's John chapter 1, verse 1, all the way to verse 51. And then we're going to have 10 major subpoints to work with under this particular section. Number two, we're going to have the revelation of Jesus, the Son of God. That'll be John chapter 2, verse 1, all the way to John chapter 3, verse 21. And we're going to have six major subpoints. We're going to work on that. And then the book of Revelation of Jesus, the new master. 
the new master, and that's going to be John chapter 3, verses 22 to 36, and we'll work with seven subpoints with that in the book of John. And number four, the revelation of Jesus, the living water, the living water, that'll be John chapter 4, verses 1 through 42, and we're going to have five major subpoints to work with that. And then we're going to have number five, the revelation of Jesus, the object of faith the object of faith, and that'll be John chapter 4, verse 43 to 54, and we're going to work with two major subpoints there, and then we're going to do number six, the, the revelation of Jesus, the authority and power over life, the authority and power over life, and that's going to be John chapter 5, verses 1 through 47, 47, and then we're going to work with uh, number eight, number seven, uh, that'll be um, the revelation of uh, Jesus Christ, of Jesus, the bread of life, the bread of life, that's going to be John chapter 6, 1 all the way through verse 71, 1 through 71. And then we'll work on number 8, the responses of the revelation of Jesus, and that's going to be John chapter 8, and that'll take us all the way from verse 1 to John chapter 9, verse 41, and then we're going to work with 10 major subpoints there. And then number 10, we're going to work with uh, the revelation of Jesus, the shepherd of life, the shepherd of life, and that's going to be John chapter 10, verses 1 through 42, and we have four major subpoints there. Number 11, the revelation of Jesus, the glorified Son of Man, and that'll be John chapter 12, verses 1. Um, uh, through uh, 50, and that's going to be uh, three major subpoints there on the number 12. And then number 13, the revelation of Jesus, the great minister and his legacy, the great minister and his legacy, and that's going to be John chapter 13, verse 1, all the way to John chapter 16, verse 33. And then we'll be working with number 14, which is going to be here. Um, which is going to be the revelation of Jesus, the great intercessor, and that'll be John chapter 17, 1 through 26. That's the Lord's Prayer right there. That is the Lord's Prayer. In fact, I remember when I, went, when I taught through that particular section of Scripture in John 17, I literally spent several months um, uh, teaching through that on a Wednesday night. It just, it took several months to work through that scripture expositionally, verse by verse, unpacking it verse at a time and phrase by phrase uh, through it. And that, and that chapter is a powerful chapter there. And then we have John, and then we have number, um, uh, what I said here was um, nine, right? We talked about this. Then we have the next one. I'm sorry. Uh, we have the next one. And that's going to be 14, 15. Number 15, that's going to be the revelation of Jesus, the suffering Savior. The revelation of Jesus, the suffering Savior. That's John chapter 18, verse 1. And that'll take us all the way to John chapter 19, verse 42. And we'll have five subpoints to work there. And then we have the fifth, number 15, the revelation of Jesus, the risen Lord. The risen Lord. And that'll be John chapter 20, verse 1, all the way to the end of John chapter 21, verse 25, and we'll have eight sub points to work with there. Now, the reason why I, I do it that way uh, is because I've, what I've done is I've gone through the all 66 books in the Bible and just broken it down so that I have a working concept of what the book is. And what we're doing in the introduction to the New Testament here, we're starting out, at least in this particular semester, is we're, we're looking at Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Okay? We'll look at Acts and Romans. Mm -hmm. as a first section, because they're unique in those particular books. Then the next semester, we'll look at 1 Corinthians all the way to the book of Revelation there, and there's a lot to, to go through that. But I want you to understand is that what I've done is broken it down so that I have a working knowledge 
you know, you have to have a working knowledge of how a text fits inside a paragraph and a paragraph fits inside of a chapter and how that chapter fits inside of that particular book and how that book fits inside of that particular section of scripture or the genre that it finds itself in. So if I was going to look at, if I was going to look at the Pentateuch, for example, uh, in, in whether it be Genesis or it, whether it be Exodus or Leviticus or Numbers or Deuteronomy, um, I would have to take a scripture there and look at a, a, a particular verse inside a, its paragraph, inside of its chapter, inside of its, of its book, and inside of its genre, and that would be the Pentateuch, for example, there. And so we have to do the same thing, so we have a working knowledge as to what is actually taking place here. It is highly dangerous, in my mind, <coughs> and, uh, and that is to take a single verse and work with that verse only because we tend to take it out of its context. And so I want you to understand that's the danger of that, of being highly thematic. That doesn't mean that you cannot be thematic in your teaching because sometimes I can take a thematic, ish, uh, 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 thematic message, okay, but I will teach it through expositionally. Uh -huh. So I want you to understand so that people have a flavor and an understanding of what it actually means. So in the book of John, what we're going to do is begin to break this down so that you have a way, you have a way to identify the, that's, that's the purpose of this class, the introduction to the New Testament, is that you understand and you have a working knowledge, an overview, if you will, a survey, a panoramic view of this particular book in, that we have before us, and that is the book of John. So. We'll go back to point number one, the witness of the revelation of Jesus Christ, and you should have those handouts as well, and you should have downloaded those, those of you who are tuning in uh, for the class as well. Uh, otherwise, uh, you're lost in, in our discussion if you don't have the handouts with you. Um, the first point is going to be, number one, the witness of the revelation of Jesus Christ. The witness of the revelation of Jesus Christ. That's point number one. And you remember I told you that's going to cover chapter 1, verse 1, all the way to verse 51. So what we're going to do is we're going to work with now here is we're going to work with uh, 10 subpoints. So we're going to have 10 points that we're going to work with here in this section. So break chapter, so we can break this section down from verses 1 all the way to 51. And so we have a way to work with this. Now, number A, point A, A. Jesus, the living word, Jesus, the living word, the first witness of John the Apostle. The first witness of John the Apostle. That's the first five verses, one through five. Point B, Jesus, the light of the world. The special witness of John the Baptist. The special witness of John the Baptist. And that'll be verses six through eight of chapter one. Point C, the light of men. The second witness of John the Apostle. The second witness of John the Apostle, that's going to be verses 9 through 13. Point D. Point D. Jesus, the Word made flesh. The third witness of John the, of John the Apostle. The third witness of John the Apostle. That's going to be verses 14 to 18. Now, don't get it confused. We have the witness of John the Baptist, and we have the witness of John the Apostle. Make the distinction. Don't get them confused here. And so... We said that in point D, Jesus, the Word made flesh, uh, um, that is the third witness of John the Apostle, verses 14 and 18, and then we have point F, that would be Jesus, the Lamb of God, the Son of God, Jesus, the Lamb of God, the Son of God, the third witness of John the Baptist, the third witness of John the Baptist, that is going to be verses 29 to 34, verses 29 to 34. Uh, I'm sorry, I skipped, I skipped here one. And that's point E, Jesus the Messiah, the Lord, the second witness of John the Baptist, the second witness of John the Baptist, verses 19 to 18. And now we go to back to point F, Jesus the Lamb of God, the Son of God, the third witness of John the Baptist, verses 29 to 39. And we can begin to see this very, very clearly here as an example here. And so then you can also begin to see on uh, point G, Jesus the Messiah, the Christ, and the witness of Andrew, the witness of Andrew. And we see that here in John chapter 1, verse 35. Um, 
And when it says, and again the next day John was standing with two of his disciples and he looked at Jesus and he walked and he said, Behold, the Lamb of God. And the two disciples heard him speak and they followed him. And Jesus turned and saw them following and he said to them, What do you seek? And they said to him, Rabbi, which translated means teacher, where are you staying? And he said to them, Come and you will see. So they came and saw where, where he was staying and they stayed with him in the day, that day for it was about the tenth hour. And one of the two who had heard John speak and followed him was Andrew and Simon Peter's brother. And so we have the we have the we have here the story of Andrew here as well uh, and 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 uh, 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 of the witness of Andrew. Then we have point H. Jesus, the one who is prophesied, the witness of Philip. Now it comes Philip to be a witness of him and that starts in verse 43. We see this in 43 and 4 and 5. The next day he purposed to go into Galilee, and he found Philip, and Jesus said to him, Follow me. Now Philip was from Bethesda, the city of Andrew and Peter, and Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him to whom Moses and the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the Son of God. So he's giving a witness, this is the Messiah. Okay? We see that very, very clearly on, uh, which that becomes more profound later on. Because if very early on they, they identified him as the Messiah, he is the Son of God, how is it they wound up in a state of unbelief and confusion later on? So then we see point I, Jesus, the Son of God, the King of Israel, the witness of Nathaniel. And now Nathaniel comes in verse 46 and goes all the way to verse 49. You see in verse 46, uh, chapter 1, Nathaniel said to him, Can any good thing come out of Nazareth? Remember that? And Philip said to him, Come and see. Mm -hmm. and, and, and the story works itself all the way down to verse 49 where it says, Nathaniel answered, Rabbi, you are, look, note, note the emphatic statement. He says, Rabbi, you are. He says, you are. He says, you are. There is no discussion here, no confusion. He says, you are the Son of God, you are the King of Israel. So he identifies him openly here. Then we have point J, the Son of Man, God's mediator, the witness of Jesus himself. Jesus brings a witness of himself to it, and we see this in verse 50 and 51. He says, now, notice the words of Jesus. Jesus in, a, a, answered and said to him, Because I said to you that I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe you will see greater things than these? And then he said, Truly, truly, I say to you, you will see the heavens open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. So he declares openly his deity here clearly. So all this covers chapter 1 itself. Now let's go on to chapter 2 all the way to chapter 3. Point number 2 in our outline. The revelation of Jesus, the Son of God. The revelation of Jesus, the Son of God. And this starts in John chapter 2, verse 1, and it's going to take us all the way to John chapter 3, verse 21. And that's key to understanding. Notice how it flows, because this is a whole, if you will, these are major paragraphs of thought that have been put together. We're in the habit of just looking at verses. Now, the only reason why I work with verses is to identify the beginning and the end, okay, of a major thought pattern so that I understand where this thought begins and where it ends, and then I treat that body of language together within its own proper context. And so we have point number two, the revelation of Jesus, the Son of God. John chapter 2, verse 1, all the way to John chapter 3, verse 21. So let's break this down. So we have six revelations take place inside of John chapter 2, all the way to John chapter 3, verse 21. Number one, point A, revelation 1, the creative power the creative power. We see this in John chapter 2 verses 1 and it goes all the way to verse 11 and how is it demonstrated? Remember the wedding at the feast? Look at this. Verse 1, on the third day there was a wedding in Canaan of Galilee and the mother Jesus was there. And both Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding and when the wine ran out the mother Jesus said to him, they have no wine and Jesus said to her, woman, what does that have to do with us? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, whatever he says to you, do it. And what happens? We know the story, right? Because at the end, in verse 11, it says, The beginning of signs Jesus did, in, uh, the beginning of his signs Jesus did in Canaan of Galilee, and manifested his glory, and his disciples believed. Notice again, his disciples believed in him. Again, we have witness after witness after witness. Not only are they dialogues and interviews, but now we have miracles and signs, and at each turn, his disciples saying, we believe. 
you are, and they declare that he is. That's really important to understand because you go, well, then how did they run away? How did they co- got confused? So forth. That's what's amazing to me. Look, number two, point B, Revelation, the second Revelation, Revelation number two, Jesus is supreme over God's house. Jesus is supreme over God's house. Look with me in John chapter 2, starting in verse 12. And let's go all the way down to verse 22. And after this, he went down to Capernaum. This is after the wedding feast. And he and his mother and his brothers and his disciples, and they stayed there a few days. The the Passover of the Jews was near, and they went up to Jerusalem, right? Now they go to Capernaum. They come down. Now they headed over to to now we now now we had them now we have them at the at, in Jerusalem, and he found in the temple that there were those who were selling oxen and sheep and doves and money changers seated at the tables. Right, he made a scourge of cords and drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen. He poured out the coins of the money changers, and you know he causes a major ruckus, if you will. Okay, he turns everything upside down. He goes, we have the scene here in the book of John. We go from a wedding, and now he's in the temple, turning this thing upside down completely, all the way down to verse 22. Look at verse 22. And so when he, raised from the, when he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he said, they believed in the scripture and the word which Jesus had spoken. That's absolutely incredible. Again, notice this. Notice this theme. They believed, they believed, they believed. Okay? Now, Revelation number 3. And now we know, by, oh, before I forget, this story that we're sharing here in the money changers, in the temple, in the cleansing, this is same story is related okay, in Matthew, in chapter 21, verses 12 to 16, from a different perspective. And then we have it in Mark, in Mark chapter 11, as well from verses 15 to 19, from another different perspective. And then we have it once again in the book of Luke, chapter 19, verses 34 to 46. Revelation number three, point C, point C. Point C is Revelation number three, and that is Jesus knows all men. Now, this portion is very critical. It is crucial that you understand it before you go into this famous chapter, chapter three. And if you don't understand it, and I know what I've been doing is I've, been, I've worked through in our Sunday school class in teaching this concept, this idea of working it through. And, we're, and here's what we're doing. In John chapter 2, and remember we're looking at point C, which is Jesus knows all men. John chapter 2, verse 23 and 25. Now notice this. Now what you see is now we've gone from the wedding, the feast of Canaan, the miracle, the turning of the wine. Remember that? Okay, the water into wine, remember that? And then we go down where he steps off, he goes to Capernaum. Now the next scene, we're back into Jerusalem, right? And then he t- turns the house, the house of God upside down, chases out the money changers. And, and, and then in between that, we know, if we look at the other Gospels, right, that other signs took place. We know that. Right? And at this point, if you fail to understand to connect these long paragraphs, you're going to misapply John chapter 3, which is the most famous chapter that we know of in the New Testament, is going to be John chapter 3. And the most famous verse is going to be John 3, 16, of which that, that just drives me crazy. Because you, you know, every sporting event, at least in our country, is we got this sign, John 3, 16, and they do survey after survey and ask all these people, what's John 3, 16? They go, we have no idea. It just says John 3, 16. Okay, so the most, most well-known verse, okay, as a reference is made, and yet most people couldn't explain to you. In a, you would think that in this, in this country, you would think that in this country, okay, in the United States, that since John 3.16 is flashed on the cameras, on the television studios, on uh, 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 screens, and in all the sporting events, that in this country we would have, an art, uh, uh, we would have a, such an articulate population to be able to properly and, and profoundly theologically explain, theologically explain John 3.16, yet that is not the case. Okay? So, and that's exactly what we do as Christians inside the church circle as well, is what we do in the seminary classes, because we break everything down by verses, and we, instead of, I use verses for the beginning and the end of a thought pattern, rather than just breaking down verse by verse for the sake of taking out a verse to preach and teach on. So I want you to see this with me. This starts out in John chapter 2, verse 23. We just finished the cleansing of the temple. And now the scene changes, and look what happens. Okay? We know something between that because the other Gospels tells us that. 
But in John chapter 2, 23, it says, Now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover during the feast, many believed in his name, observing his signs which he was doing. And But Jesus on his part was not entrusting himself to them, for he knew all men, and because he did not need anyone to testify concerning man, for he himself knew what was in man. Now, understand this is the scene. Nicodemus, which is in the next chapter, chapter 3, which I'm working through in our Sunday school, is something that you need to understand. He's present at this stuff. And Jesus knows him. So if you don't understand that, then you're going to misunderstand why he gets rebuked later on in John chapter 3, verse 9 and 10. Look at this. So I want you to see that with me. So that's really important. Then we got point D. Point D, revelation number four. Here's the fourth revelation, and that is the actual new birth. He discusses the new birth in verses 1, John chapter 3, all the way to verse 15. It's the actual new birth, right? Which is what baffles me why everybody holds up 316. That's what baffles me. Because 316 starts out a whole other section. Let me show you. Point the fourth revelation. Revelation, the fifth revelation. Revelation number five, this is point E, and that's going to be God's great love. This talks about his love. We've reduced 16 and 17 back into it, back into the salvation story. All right? And, not, and we see, we, 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 we've got it so muddled that we can't make the distinction. So now in John 3, 16 and 17, it talks about his love. Then we have this, now we have point F, this is the sixth revelation, so we have six revelations that are given to us here from John chapter 2, verse 1, all the way to John chapter 3, verse 21, and here's point F, revelation number 6, which is man's condemnation. Here is where man brings forth what? Unto himself what? You remember the book of Revelation, it says there would be a time when man would wish that the rocks would fall upon him so that he didn't have to face the judgment of God. The fool doesn't know that it doesn't matter if they fall on him or not, he's going to face the judgment of God. And so John, cha John chapter 3 tells us that once the, once the love of God has been rejected, and that is John 3, 16 and 17, then 18 and 19 is very clear for us, and he lays it out for us where he says this. He says, he who believes in him is not judged, but he who does not believe has been judged already because he has not what? He has not believed in the name of the Son of the only begotten Son. So you see the concept already 11 times from chapter 1 till we get here. The, the concept of believe, 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 believe is flowing right through the text at every single turn. And we see this from the very beginning up until this point in time. Welcome back, lecture three, part lecture three, and we're going to start part three. Uh, now, le I'm sorry, lecture eleven, part three. Now, here's what we want to do. I've ha we just finished the discussion about talking about how we tie these paragraphs together. Here's another section that will stand by itself because it's a separate thought pattern together. Now, we're going to look at number three: the revelation of Jesus, the new master, the new master. This would be Revelation, uh, this would be John chapter 3, verse 22 to 26, uh, all the way, 22 to 36. I'll get it together yet. Hang on a second. From 22 to 36, and here's what I want you to see. We're going to look at this section here under number 3, and we're going to look at uh, seven major points to work with here. There are actually seven points to work with in this body of Scripture. A, the setting of the revelation, the setting of the actual revelation. Look at this starting in verse John chapter 3, verse 22. And this is the backdrop, the setting of it. It is with John the Baptist. It says, And after these things, Jesus and his disciples came into the land of Judea, and, they were, and there he was spending time with them and baptizing. Now, this is the backdrop, okay, to the revelation. Now, we get caught up in the conversation about the baptism and forget why the backdrop is there. Right? And so we see it there, and it goes all the way to verse 26. And John was also baptizing in Anian near Salim because there was much water there, and people were coming and were being baptized, for John had not yet been thrown into prison. Verse 25, therefore there arose a discussion on the part of John's disciples with a Jew about purification. Verse 26, and they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, 
he who was with you beyond the Jordan, to whom you have testified, behold, he is baptizing, and all are coming to him. So this is the backdrop, okay? This is the revelation. This is the revelation of what? Of whom? Of Jesus. That's what's about to take place here. I want you to see that with me. Point B. Now we have answers. You remember that up to this point, we have Revelation 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. We have a parenthetical note here in verses 22 to 26 about another revelation here. And now we're going to have answers that are given. Answers are given as to all this that's taking place. Answer number one, Jesus, point B, answer number one, Jesus alone was God's appointed Messiah. So now we get this. We just read verse 26, right? Luke 27, John answered and said, now this is John's response. Now you could have gotten, you could get caught up in pride. You could get up, you could get caught up in ministerial competition, if you will. But that's not what John the Baptist does. You want to talk about a, a, a complete spiritual man, a man of great maturity and humbleness. Look at what he says in verse 27. John answered and said, a man can receive nothing unless it has been given to him from heaven. And you yourselves are my witnesses that I said, I am not the Christ, but I have been sent ahead of him. I've been sent ahead of him. So you see that? Answer number two, point C. Point C, answer number two, Jesus alone was the bridegroom. Jesus alone was the bridegroom. So we're, be, we're getting answers here. And you would think by this point that the disciples are hearing these answers. Remember, they're saying well, they believe, they believe, they believe, they declare, they declare, they declare, he is, he is. Okay? Now look at, the, look at these answers. And we get to John 3, 29, and we go to verse 30. He who has, who he who was the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. So this joy of mine has been made full. He must increase and I must decrease. Now we hear this verse quoted all the time out of context. Okay? But he's giving an answer. He's giving us a clear answer as to who he is. John's not taking a prominent role. He doesn't pretend to take a prominent role. His preeminence is not at the forefront of his mind, but a lot of people put it there, okay, in their own minds. Point D, point D, answer number three. Jesus alone was from above, from heaven. He says in verse 31, he says, He who comes from above is above all, and he who is of the earth is from the earth and speaks of the earth. He who comes from heaven is above all. He declares openly, okay, declares openly that Jesus is coming from heaven heaven directly. Then point E, answer number four, Jesus alone was God's spokesman. Only Jesus could speak for God. He makes this open declaration starting in verse 32. Look at this, in verse 32 to verse 34. He says, what he has seen and heard of what he is, and, and, and he, and, I'm sorry, what he has seen and heard of that he testifies, and no one receives his testimony. He's talking about this is the Messiah, the right? This is the Son of God who is seen and heard directly from the Father in heaven. And he says, and no one receives his testimony. He who has received the testimony has set his seal to this, that God is true. For he whom God has sent speaks the words of God, for he gives the Spirit without measure. Without measure. Look at this. Point F, number five. Jesus alone had the full measure of the Spirit. That's what we just finished reading here in verse 34. And number six, the answer number six, which is point G, Jesus alone determines man's destiny. He makes it very clear. Yeah. Look what he says, verse 35. The Father loves the Son and has given all things into his hand. He who believes in the Son has eternal life, but he who does not obey the Son will not see life, but the wrath of God abides in him. There is no doubt whatsoever about the deity and the Messiahship of who Jesus Christ is. None. We've, we immediately, immediately this is established in John chapter 1, verse 1, right from the very beginning. And throughout, what's weaved throughout the text is the disciples repeatedly giving witness to this fact and they themselves with their own mouths declaring that they believe this. 
And not only do they believe it, but they call them that, and they acknowledge that. Now we get to the next section. Number four, <clears throat> the revelation of Jesus, the living water. The revelation of Jesus, the living water. Now this is going to start out in chapter 4, verse 1, and we're going to walk all the way through verse 22. Verse 42, sorry, verse 42. So here what we have here is we're going to work with five major subpoints. Right? So A, the offering, the offer of living water. The offer of living water. So now we've we've already established that he is the Messiah. Notice how this text flows, and I want, to see, I want you to see the flow of this book, the book of John. So he starts out in John chapter 1, I'm um, sorry, John chapter 4, verses 1 through 42, but in this section it's going to be verses 1 through 14. Now, he gives the witness at the well. Remember that? Remember the woman at the well? That, that story? So therefore, when the Lord knew that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, although Jesus himself was not baptizing, but his disciples were, he left Judea and went again into Galilee. And he had passed through Samaria. So he came into the city of Samaria called Sychar, near the parcel of the ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph, and Jacob's well was there. So Jesus was wearied, about, wearied from his journey, was sitting thus by the well, and it was about the sixth hour. And then we know the story, right? We know how the story unpacks, right? And, and there's this dialogue that takes place here. Look at verse 11. Jesus said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw with. The well is deep. Where then do you get the living, that living water? Verse 12, You are not greater than our father Jacob. Are you who, give, who gave us the well and drank of it himself and his sons and his cattle? And Jesus answered and said to him, Everyone who drinks of this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him shall never thirst, but that the water that I will give him will become in him a well of water springing up to eternal life. You see how he's declaring openly who he is? He's not running. He's not hiding. So from the very beginning, through the perspective of the eyes of John the Apostle, who's giving a witness here, not only does John the Apostle give three major witnesses, not only does John the Baptist give three major witnesses here, but we have his disciples giving major witnesses to who he is openly, right from the beginning. I mean, that's the reason why I told you that the book of John starts out before the creation. Okay? And it declares his deity right there in verse 1, right at the beginning. Now, <clears throat> we get also to the subject of sin. Point B, the subject of sin comes up immediately here. That'll be verses, four, verses 15 to 18. Look at this. And he says, And the woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I will, in my th I will not be thirsty nor, all the way, nor, nor come all the way here to draw. And he said to her, Go call your husband and come here. And the woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said, You have correctly said, I have no husband. For you have had five husbands, and the one whom you have now is not your husband. This you have said truly. So now we have the, now, so he confronts sin immediately. He's confronting sin. He's not wasting time. I mean, we've got enough declaration taking place there of who he is. Point C. Now comes up the point, the subject of worship. The subject of worship comes up immediately. So notice how everything ties into his deity. Sin cannot be before him. Now the issue of worship comes up. Chapter 4, verse 19. Look at this. All the way to verse 24. We see this, and he says this. And the woman said to him, Sir, I perceive you are a prophet. Our fathers worship in this mountain, and you people say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Now, I don't want to get into the argument or all the details of this. I, mean, I just want to highlight, highlight the issue that now the deity of Jesus Christ is in open display, and he discusses, he, and he discusses now worship. And he says in verse 24, God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him spirit and truth. Now, notice this. This is another verse that's very famous and quoted. It's very famous and quoted all the time. Here's the problem. We usually quote this verse out of its context, okay? And in that quote, we fail repeatedly over and over again to recognize his deity and his sovereignty, that he is the true and living God. Next section. That will be point D, the subject of the Messiah itself. The subject of the Messiah comes up. This starts in verse 25. And in verse 25, and work it all the way down to verse 30, look at what happens here. He says this, <clears throat> The woman said to him, I know that the Messiah is coming, he who is called Christ, and that the one who comes, he will declare all things to us. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. Does this sound like he's hiding? No. Very clearly. So he works all the way down. 
Okay? And then look at verse 29. And the, and, and, and the woman, she recognizes, finally she gets this message, right? Look at the impact. So at this point in verse 27, excuse me, verse 27 says, his disciples came and they were amazed that he had been speaking with a woman, yet no one said, what do you seek? What do you seek? Or why do you speak with, with her? Verse 20, so the woman left her water pot. She went into the city and said to the men, come and see a man who told me all the things that I have done. This is not the Christ, is it? <coughs> she makes a declarative statement, right? With, with an interrogatory note, which would be a question, right? He says, and, and look at it, he says, in verse 30, and they went out of the city and were coming to him. She knew something miraculous had taken place here. The scales from her eyes had opened. Deity himself, the divine one, had visited her. Now, then we get into the labor. Now, the subject of labor for God. Now, notice this, that if you were talking in the church today and you were applying this to the church, you would have to come to the point and recognize that that the church today lacks much. It lacks much in this. Look at the subject of the labor for God. Verses, now we start in verse 31, and we're going to we'll work it to the end of verse 42, right? Meanwhile, the disciples were urging him, saying, Rabbi, eat. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about, right? And now he begins to talk about the labor. See, Jesus talks about, you know, and look what he says in verse 35. Do you not say that there are yet four months and then comes the harvest? Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields that they are white for the harvest. And already he who reaps is receiving the wages and gathering fruit for the life eternal, so that he who sows and he who reaps may rejoice together. <coughs> Excuse me. And then, so he works all the way down, all the way to verse 42, where he says, Many, many more believe because of his word. And they were saying to the woman, It is no longer because of what you said that we believe. For we have heard for ourselves and know that this one is indeed the Savior of the world. <coughs> Excuse me. So I want you to see this with him. And so what we have, we have that the deity and we have the expectations of what the deity has for us. Right? Clearly. He offers us living water. Okay? Eternal life. We confront sin. Right? We worship him, right? We acknowledge that he is the Messiah, right? right? And we work for him. Hmm? Point number five, the revelation of Jesus, the object of faith. The revelation of Jesus, the object of faith. This is point number five. We have two subpoints to work with here, and let's look at this. We're going to look at verses 43 to 54 and come to the end of this chapter. And here's what we have, point A, the evidence of faith. Now, he, now, deity declares, sovereignty declares, and deals with the subject of faith immediately. There is no time to waste here. Look what we see here, verse 43. And after two days, um, he went forth from there into Galilee. Now, remember, he was in Samaria. Remember that? And for Jesus himself testified that a prophet has no honor in his own country. So when he came to Galilee, the Galileans received him, having seen all the things that he did in Jerusalem at the feast, for they themselves were also went to the feast. This is very clear what's taking place here, right? Then, so, this is the, they seen, there is no misunderstanding whatsoever. Then Jesus speaks about the stages of faith, point B, the stages of faith, the gradation of faith, right? The steps of faith, if you will. And that starts in verse 46, and we're going to close this chapter, chapter 4. Look what he says. Therefore, he came, and came, he came again to Canaan of Galilee, where he had made the water wine. See how we're coming full circle? And there was a royal official whose son was sick at Capernaum. And it says, and when he heard that Jesus had come out of Judea into Galilee, he went to him and was imploring him to come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. So Jesus said to him, unless you people see signs and wonders, you simply will not believe. Stop there. Right? Now, is it not true that from the very beginning, this, you see how believing is into women into this text? We, it just flows right into this text. His disciples declare openly who he was. Others believe because of his word. Remember that? Remember in Samaria? You know, they said, you know, well, 
We don't just believe because she said it to us. We believe because of his word. His word. We believe. His word. They had no signs. They had no wonders. Now he leaves there and he goes over to Capernaum, right? And remember these people? They remembered him, right? Remember from the wedding of the feast in Canaan? Turning, you know, the water into, in, into signs? Now we pick this up again and look what happens. He says here. Unless, he said, so Jesus said to him, unless you people see signs and wonders, you simply will not believe. Now look at the royal response. Verse 49, the royal official said this to him, Sir, come down before my child dies. Jesus said to him, Go, your son lives. He didn't even have to go. He says, Go, your son lives. Now look at this. Now this is what fascinates me because remember, Everything we've discussed up to this point, chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3, chapter 4, we're coming to the end of chapter 4, okay? His disciples are with him. Look at this. He says, go, your son lives. And the man what? He jumped him down, had a temper tantrum, he screamed. He said, no, I don't believe you, what? what? No, no, it says, <coughs> it says, the man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him and started off. He believed. Look what it says. And as he was now going down, his slaves met him saying that his son was living. Wow. <coughs> Incredible. Are you, seeing, are you seeing his faith grow? You see the gradation of faith? You see the stages of faith? You see the steps of faith? It's just growing. It's growing. You see that? It's growing. Look at this. Verse 52, so he inquired of them the hour, and he says, so he inquired of them the hour when he began to get better. He goes, when did this happen? And they said to him, yesterday at the seventh hour, the fever left him. That's when I was talking to Jesus, right? Verse 53, so the father knew that it was at the hour in which Jesus said to him, your son lives, and he himself believed in his whole household. This is, again, a second sign that Jesus performed when he had come out of Judea into Galilee. First, the first major sign and miracle is the wedding feast. Now we get to the second major sign. He goes to Capernaum, to Samaria. He turns around, comes back to Galilee. Is what? He tells the royal official, go, your son will live. He's healed. Now do you see? But can you see in the text is being woven right through? So now we come to the end of chapter 4. Now we start chapter 5. Look at this. Point number 6. The revelation of Jesus, the authority, and the power over life. The revelation of Jesus and the authority and the power over life. Now we're going to go through verses 1 through 47 of chapter 5, and let's break this down to four major sections, and let's begin with verse 1 and begin to look at it. So we have number one, the essential authority. The essential authority, the power to meet the world's desperate needs. The power to meet the world's desperate needs. Now, you would think that everybody who approaches God is always on the basis of need, right? <clears throat> so here's he demonstrates it now. Look at the first 16 verses, very clear here, look what he says. And after these things, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up and up to Jerusalem, right? So now, remember, that, remember they're going to bring a paralytic man, remember that story? <clears throat> and so I want, you to see, I want you to see it in terms of how this is unfolded for us. And it says, and now there was in Jerusalem by the sheep gate a pool where he is called in Hebrew Bethesda, having five portal, ha, having five porticles, and in these laid a multitude of those who were sick and blind, lame and withered, and waiting for the moving of the waters. For an angel of the Lord moved, it says, uh, move, went, of, the, of the Lord went down in certain seasons into the pool and stirred the water. Whoever then first entered after the stirring of the water stepped, uh, stepped in and was made well from whatever the disease which, which he was afflicted, and so forth. So we know the story that unpacks, right? We see it here. And look what he says here. And it goes down. And when verse 6, and when Jesus saw him lying there, he knew that he had already been a long time in that condition. He already knew it. Again, declaring his deity. Open. You see how his deity is being declared over and over and over again? Verse 8, Jesus said to him, get up and pick up your pallet and walk. Didn't touch the guy, right? He says, and immediately the man came up, became well, and picked up his pallet and began to walk. Right? Now, now the confrontation comes. 
Now the confrontation comes. Now, here's the one who gave the law, but he's going to be com- he's going to be condemned by the very law that he gave by who? By the law keepers. So we we see here in verse <coughs> in verse nine. Now it was at the Sabbath on that. Now it was the Sabbath on that day. So the Jews were saying to the man who was cured, "Is it is it is it the Sabbath?" He says, "And it is not permissible for you to carry your pallet." <laughs> now he's being condemned for carrying the pallet after he got healed. Can you imagine? The guy never walked before. But he answered them, he who made me well was the one who said to me, pick up your pallet and walk. And they asked him, well, who's that? Who's the man who said to you, pick up your pallet and so forth and so forth. And so we see this in verse 16. For this reason, the Jews were persecuting Jesus because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. Isn't it amazing how we can get so petty and so religious? Absolutely amazing. Point B, the astounding authority. (coughs) Okay? Equality with God. Now they get mad. Right? Now they get mad because now they're going to confront him and go, wow, now we finally got him. He's broken the law. Right? And, and he, they can't. They can't do that. They just simply cannot do that. But they're going to confront him. Okay? Isn't that what we do today? We got rules and regulations. It doesn't matter what the Word of God says. And we're going to condemn the preacher and condemn anybody who violates our rules and regulations. 